the founder and the president of the Grow Small Biz California organization, uh, Jack Frost, and uh, that's a, a, a subsidiary, I guess, or uh, works well, under a, the aegis a, of the it, National it, Tax it, Limitation it, it's Committee. It's a special project underneath the special National project. Tax Limitation Special project, okay, Committee. it's founded yeah. by Lou Euler and yeah. Milton Friedman. Yeah, and, yeah Milton and, Friedman was um, one of our founding directors. Okay. We're really proud of that. Yeah. It was founded back in 75, and Lou's still going strong. Good, good. And our uh, other illustrious uh, panelist is uh, the chairman of the El Dorado County uh, Libertarian Party, as well as an at-large member of the California Executive Committee uh, from El Dorado, Tyler Kuski. Welcome to the show. Good to be here. Okay. Um, speaking of uh, your bailiwick, which is the intersection of business and politics, um, you've got a, an event coming up, right? We do. Tell us a little bit about that, and we'll, and we'll uh, give people a chance to uh, review it toward the end of the well, show. Well, it's on October the 17th. Okay. It's going to be at the Dante Club. Okay. Uh, it's a, a kind of a two-part event. The first part of the event is all going to be wrapped around chambers of commerce. We have 12 um, multicultural chambers that have committed to the event. Um, chambers are having a difficult time today because citizens are not as active as they used to be. You know, with the internet and being online, they're comfortable staying at home. They're not as, they're not as willing to go out and go to meetings and be as active in the community as they used to be. Um, and so chambers are um, fighting to try to attract more people because they do a lot for our communities. They, you know, they support our businesses. They, they sponsor and support a lot of community events. And so they're kind of the glue that kind of helps the social part and the business part of our communities work together. So we want people to come out, learn a little bit more about what the chambers do, get an opportunity to, to maybe consider becoming members of some of these chambers. And, um, and then um, after the chamber mixer takes place, then we have Dan Walters, who has done about 9,000 political articles. He's probably the uh, California guru when it comes to um, a political columnist. He's, uh, he was with the Sacramento Bee for 33 years. And he's from the, the, the old days when he actually would report, not you know, try to push an agenda. So he has observed and has great insight about the political landscape in California. So he'll be there. We've invited um, Congressman. An actual shoe leather uh, journalist. Yeah, yeah, an actual reporter yeah. that, that actually reports on what's going on. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting new concept. Yeah. And uh, we've invited uh, Amy Barra, Congressman Amy Barra from the 7th District, and, uh, and Andrew Grant, who's uh, running against him, to be able to come and share some of their thoughts about business and tax reform and um, you know, how they see business moving forward in a positive way. So I think it's going to be a really, really great, exciting event. It's only 20 bucks. Uh, there's gonna and that be, includes dinner. And that includes a lot of food. There's okay. going to be a great buffet and of hors d'oeuvres and um, desserts and all that sort of thing. 20 bucks, um, the way you register is you go to the internet, www.limittaxes. Limit Taxes is the URL for the National Tax Limitation Committee. So we're trying to make it easy. So you limit taxes, www.limittaxes.eventbrite.com. Eventbrite is the online registration that almost all the events are using today. So that's how you register, and we hope you'll come out and, uh, and join us. It's going to be a wonderful event. That's the event, Bright spelled B-R-I-T-E? Yes, B-R-I-T-E. I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say are the, uh, the, the critical elements that chambers are trying to use to uh, uh, deliver the, uh, the, the high quality of life to communities uh, and, and business in general? Well, I think when it comes to the quality of life in communities, um, it kind of all boils down to a couple of things. Um, if you look around the country and you find communities that are struggling, it's because businesses are struggling. If you then go deeper into why our business is struggling in that area, you probably find high crime rates. So the areas where businesses are doing the best or when you have good public policy and, um, and the police are, big, are effective in those areas. Because if you have high crime rates, you're not going to have businesses being attracted to those areas. So I think the, 
what the what the chambers really work hard at doing is bringing the communities together through a, a lot of different um, events that they sponsor and supporting businesses so that those businesses can learn different techniques on how to be more effective in business so um, I think those are the two the two primary elements uh, you, you're not going to have home values being stable and going up if you don't have a thriving economy so the economy needs stability and home prices need a strong economy because when people are moving into it people don't move into a community unless it's safe and there are, and it's a prospering community so you'll see home values go down even in a strong housing market if people are leaving the community because home prices are all about supply and demand just like every product is based on supply and demand so we've really got to have low crime we've got to have effective policing and that will attract businesses and the chambers help support those businesses okay so that's the uh, message there. what are the things that government uh, can do and should avoid doing uh, to uh, foster a good a good uh, environment for business to prosper a government should um, make it easier for businesses to get their licenses. Okay, they so should, e easy you know, licensing for, so, for entrepreneurial uh, uh, enterprises? Right, and, and I think the less regulations, the less red tape, um, the, the less taxes, really the better. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, you've got Major U right now, Major use the sales tax increase. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the repeal of the gas tax on the ballot. That's another 12 cents on our gas tax. When you start taking dollars out of the pockets of our consumers, the ones that are hurt the worst by these types of higher taxes and higher fees, they're the ones that are unemployed. They're the ones that are low income, the middle class, the seniors. These are the groups that are are hurt the most because now they don't have dollars to be able to go out to dinner or to buy supplies for their kids to go to school. Now so, those are two uh, California ballot initiatives, so they'll, they'll affect the yeah. state as a whole, right? Well, no. The Major U, from what I understand, is the Sacramento City increase tax. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's Sacramento Homie. Yeah. Okay. Now the, the, the gas tax repeal, which is, I think, Proposition 6, mm -hmm. That's that's that's, that's a statewide tax. So yeah. the so the uh, gas tax repeal would be something that would help the state of California uh, in competition with other states, whereas Measure U would uh, potentially, I guess, what harm uh, Sacramento in competition. Well, with it, other it cities? just I mean it, it just hurts the people that live in Sacramento City mm -hmm. because uh, that tax that uh, that increase in sales tax isn't going to affect. You, if you don't live in in Sacramento City, for right? What so, I so it will hurt Sacramento yeah. as a place to live yeah, compared a, to Fresno or yeah. Stockton or Vallejo or any any other city. Yeah, well, nearby. it just it just means you're you're paying more, and it, may, and, it, and it puts the burden. That burden is always passed on to the businesses, who then have to pass it on to the consumers. So, um, when you when you start increasing the top line cost of a business, in terms of productivity and, and in terms of taxes and cost of goods and services. In order for the bottom line to stay the same and continue to improve, they've got to pass that on to the consumer. The consumer really winds up paying in the end. You, Unfo unfortunately, that's just kind of the way it works. Yeah. You mentioned uh, licensing, uh, ease of licensing. That's an, I'd like to drill down into that a little bit because that's an interest of great, of great interest to me. Uh, we see uh, in at the state level in particular uh, industries try where the, where the businesses themselves uh, try to get uh, more strict licensing in essence to limit competition to the people uh, or competition for the people who are already in business we see that in for instance the the moving van industry uh, in California and other states where People who are the owners of established moving companies will say, hey, we need to make sure that everybody that's competing with us is pro properly 
properly uh, insured and uh, have background checks to make sure they don't, uh, you know, they're, they're not hiring people that would be uh, dangerous to their customers and so forth and so on. A lot of, a lot of fear stuff, a lot of things that, uh, w you know, putting up an, a whole lot of red flags saying we need a government agency to come in and protect us from competition by people who are cutting corners, essentially. And once they're in place, once those agencies are in place, they tend to be populated, the bureaucrats that are in those agencies tend to be populated by people from the industry. And not surprisingly, they tend to say, well, I don't think we need any more competition. We, we're doing just fine the way things are. Let's keep prices up. Is that something that you run across? You know, I, my background in business has been in the mortgage banking business and in okay. real estate. And so the licensing really has not been an issue in the businesses that I've been in, involved in. Because they're not licensed. Well, no, they, you are licensed. Uh, you have to have a real estate license in okay. order to but that's sell not hard to real get. estate. But it's not hard to get. And, and the licensing requirements are pretty much the same uh, in all the states as far as, as far as real estate goes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, this is the first time I've heard your take on the licensing issue um, being being the way I've never heard that take before, but that's that's really inter interesting. I I don't think that well, you, you see that in like I said the moving industry. You see that among hairdressers, where people who braid hair, uh, you know, have to go to a, a very expensive cosmetology school that has absolutely nothing to do with braiding before they're given a license I mean, to braid hair. Licensing actually does affect. Um, or limits, I guess you should say, on, on what certain activities I can do in my small business that I have. Okay, uh, what, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So I, what I, what a lot of times what I do is I, uh, I install security cameras mm -hmm. through my business, uh, but there you do have to have a security license depending on what type of security uh, hardware you're installing. So you can do security cameras, but you can't do security alarms, but you can do this, you can do that. Uh, and so if I had the license, uh, which, which I am considering getting just so I can expand my work, uh, but there is a restriction and it's a very, I'm, I'm right there back against the line. And my business started off just mounting TVs, but eventually it merged into something else. But as and anybody who starts a business, they always know that your business is going to, you're going to merge into other things. You can start learning that you actually already have other skill sets. Uh, but I am growing right against the wall on what I need a license for versus what I didn't need a license for before. So the licensing procedure, in essence, is slowing down the expansion. It, of it, it's slowing down, yeah, in, this, in a very essence. I'm not, I'm not uh, exactly, you know, it's not really a big concern. I, I have looked into getting a license. It's only uh, almost thousand dollars, but you know, it's it's uh, which is not nothing for a small business. <laughs> exactly. And you have to pass the tests and, and back yeah, and you got to do, do do all those all those testing and stuff. Um, and actually, it, is, it doesn't really, uh, you know, protect people because a lot of times. The license is meant to, you know, protect people from, uh, you know, criminals installing your security equipment, which is a good idea. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, uh, but there, but I can already do certain security things already, like installing security cameras. So what stopped me from doing that? Why is it only licensed a certain part of it? Well, what it is is there's actually already um, a huge industry in that. So ADT and all those type of companies have already gone. Who are not looking for more competition? Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Well, you know, we were, we were talking about business challenges in business. Mm -hmm. and, you know, right now, small businesses are leaving the state of California at the highest rate ever recorded. Now, that's in... Now, that's now in, some small businesses can leave and some can't. I mean, if you have a, I don't know, uh, uh, a business that's, that's geographically tied, like a, like a real estate business, you can't, really, you, can't, you can't move your real estate business if you're selling California real estate. Right. But if you're selling, but if you're manufacturing something, you can go anywhere, right? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Right. But they're they're leave, but they're not leaving California. I don't think for that reason. I think they're leaving because it's just an, a very unfriendly business environment here, and so. And that's the political environment. And, and that's the political environment is is really the big part of it, and um, so you mentioned the um, you were, you mentioned the uh, hauling business, mm -hmm. and an, an interesting thing, a friend of mine just recently moved his business to Boise, Idaho. Okay. Because the regulations were just making it too difficult here. Mm -hmm. And what kind so of he rented- what, what kind of business was it? Uh, it was, it's actually a, a movie, it's actually an online movie business where people that are trying to get parts in a movie are, are actually lined up with 
movie producers who are looking for actors. Okay. So it's like a kind of a mix and match type of a thing. Isn't so like Boise, Idaho, like, the weirdest place to have a production? So that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's like an employment agency yeah. for yeah. actors. Yeah, okay. a, a little bit. Yeah. So what was interesting is he rented a U-Haul truck to move his business uh -huh. in Boise, Idaho. I know where the story's going. Yeah. <laughs> and it was $1,000. Okay. $1,000 to move his business from Roseville to Boise, Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so when he gets gets there, um, he's taking the truck back to the shop and he says, I'm just curious, you know, how much does it cost if I want to rent a truck from Boise, Idaho back to California? And they said about 90 bucks. Yep. <laughs> and the reason it was 90 bucks is they, they basically somebody almost to, somebody to move pay back. people just to get the trucks back to California because they need the trucks because there's a shortage of U-Haul trucks yeah. moving people out of the state of California, yeah, yeah. which, I mean, that is a pretty dramatic way of thinking about the supply and demand and the, yeah. and the exit of businesses out of California. So I, I once moved from Wisconsin to get to Texas, West Texas, back when the oil was, the oil patch was booming back in, back in the early 80s. And it cost me X number of dollars to move to Texas, or I could take the uh, truck across the border into New Mexico, and it was about five hundred dollars less, wow. for whatever reason. Yeah, <laughs> supply and demand sets the price. Yeah, well, it always it always does. Um, so, measure you. I'm I'm taking. I'm assuming you're taking a stand on that. Yeah, I, I would be against. I'd be against sales tax increase. That that'll hurt. That'll hurt the poor and the unemployed and the seniors the most. And it'll take money out of their pockets, and that'll be less that they can spend. That'll, when you spend less, that that's not good for business. And gas so, tax, I'm assuming you want that to to yeah, go I'm, down. I, I would like to see that go down. And while we're talking about the gas tax, um, something interesting that I just learned the other day, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the uh, apparently the attorney general has the last word on the way that the language shows up on the on the ballot so when the repeal of the gas tax was um, got their signatures and all of that to be on the ballot everybody assumed that there would be something in the language in the title title and summary of the bill that this would be a repeal of the gas tax well at the end of the line apparently and this is the way the story was told to me, so I don't know how accurate the process part of it was. But at the end of the day, the Attorney General was able to change the title and summary so that no place, when you go to the ballot for Proposition 6, you are not going to see repeal the gas tax. You're not going to see repeal any place in the bill. So, But it changed the wording, but did it change the effect? In a big way, because now the the word wordage is is something to the effect that this is going to reduce revenues for our roads. <laughs> no, no. What I, what I meant was, um, but it's not going to change the effect if it passes. It'll the effect it passes. It'll, 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 not, not the voter effect. It won't. The, it won't change the bill itself. Okay. But if it'll you're, change, it'll, it'll make yeah, it difficult, but a lot more of people will read that thinking that they were for the repeal. But then they'll read the summary in the title, and it says uh, this is going to reduce revenues for our roads. And then they're going to think, well, oh my God, our roads are in such bad shape. You know, yeah. we need this money yeah. in order to take care of our yeah. roads. And so they will not vote correctly because now they have a misconception. Save my what roads. The bill is, is about. Yeah. If yeah. you want to have more revenue for uh, the roads, you can lower the drinking age. The, uh, because the biggest fear, reason why most states uh, or every state has drinking age set to 21 is because the uh, uh, hi highway trust fund uh, will cut road funding by 10%, federal road funding. But someone actually did the math and found out that the tax revenue, if you, allow, if you lower the drinking age to 18, would actually make up for the missing uh, revenue that the highway trust fund- Are you talking about, you're talking federal, federal yes, uh, federal revenue. revenue sharing? Yes. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Actually, we could, if you took a very, very small portion, a very small portion of the money that's been allocated for the high-speed rail, 
you could fix every single road in California and you could widen the interstates. And what's really interesting about all that is how many people are actually going to use the high-speed rail versus how many people use the roads every single day and the highways every single day. Yeah, and the, and and the, yet, only, the only advantage of, of rail, traveling by rail, is you don't have to drive. But with the uh, advent of self-driving cars, hey, <laughs> you don't have to drive those either. The train was built too late. <laughs> Wrong century. I yeah, mean, I don't. I mean, we're, we're applying 19th century technology to 21st yeah. century problems. Well, I know that the cost of the high-speed rail has, like, doubled and tripled and quadrupled, and they have all sorts of issues with right-of-ways. And it has something to do with the same contractor building the high-speed rail that built the, uh, the big dig in Boston. Uh, back in the day, if I'm not mistaken. An issue of competence there. An issue, yes. You, you, uh, you, uh, any uh, position that you guys would take on, on environmental issues? Um, you know, I'm an, I'm, I believe in clean air and clean water and, and all that. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, before I got involved in this project, I used to be the, um, uh, the regional director for the um, uh, for CHIRP, the Community Home Energy Retrofit Project. And our job was helping people retrofit their homes and reduce the carbon by reducing their utility bills and their energy usage. And so we did seminars where we actually taught homeowners how to reduce energy first and, and by using energy efficient improvements they would qualify for PG&E and SMUD rebates. And then once they had reduced their usage, then they would need a lot less solar panels to take it down another notch. So we showed them how to, to reduce and improve the environment in a, in a cost-effective economic environment where it stimulated more business, it reduced energy. We, we, saved, um, we saved over $300 in our pg and &E and SMUD bill as, reduce of our, as, as, a, as a result of our home energy retrofit. That means 300 bucks a month that we could spend in the local economy versus sending it to pg and &E and SMUD. Those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of um, practical business approaches to the environment that we need to see more of, not regulations where they come up with a cap and tax and they take your money and what do they do with it and how does that, how does that all work? Um, we, we really need to find better business solutions to some of our en environmental challenges. I'm, I'm guessing that you have a, a fairly easy time getting uh, or finding a constituency among uh, conservatives or Republicans. Uh, do you also find good, solid, uh, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, blue dog Democrats, conservative Democrats, or conservative uh, libertarians, or pro-business libertarians, or, or Democrats that uh, are interested in getting behind pro-business uh, proposals in California? Well, the, the pro-small business Biz California project is not at all um, Republican or Democrat. It's really our litmus test is legislation is either good for business or it's not good for business. What we found is we have a lot of statistics that show that when employees start understanding, when they start connecting the, the legislation to the bottom line of their business, when they understand that that impacts them directly, because if their business is being challenged by poor public policy, then they're not as likely to get a pay raise or, or a keep promotion or you know, maybe their boss was putting money in their 401k, maybe that will slow down or stop. Maybe he was trying to help with health care premiums. I mean, all those are tied to the bottom line. So when an employee understands the public policy affects them directly, they're much more likely to be engaged. They're much more likely to vote. So our mission is to help educate them and uh, connect those, those dots so that, they, that they're, they're more informed. Now, uh, how do you define the role that chambers play in doing all of that? Oh, the, 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 the chambers, um, they play a role. One of the, I think that one of the challenges the chambers have is they are 
a little bit more reluctant than they used to be to get into the political game, so to speak. Because a lot of times uh, they invite, you know, the politicians to their events. They want to acknowledge them at the events. They don't want to hurt their feelings. They don't want to, you know, go against the tide. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that chambers are struggling is because they're not as proactive as they need to be in terms of helping employees and employers understand um, these various bills and how they're going to affect the businesses. And when they start working a little bit harder on that, I think the business owners and the employees are going to see a, a, a stronger value proposition. So am I, am I, can I paraphrase by saying that uh, potential members of chambers want to have an advocate for them in the uh, uh, halls of power as opposed to, to somebody that's yeah, going to just they, roll over? They really need to, I mean, that advocacy needs to be really strong. I mean, we've got, we've got organizations like um, NFIB, mm -hmm. and that's what they do. They, yeah. they advocate for, for businesses. And their NFIB you know, interacts with the chambers, California Business Roundtable, um, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers. That these are all organizations that are pretty much pro-business, sure. uh, pro-taxpayer organizations, and they're all sort of integrated together in the in the scheme of things. Okay, um, is between a highly a highly regulated, uh, government regulated uh, economy for business and a laissez-faire, which which is which is is better for employees and employers alike. I don't know, Tyler, you're in business. Uh, how would you answer that? <laughs> I put uh, you on the spot, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you already know my answer. <laughs> and it is? No government. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, okay. The, you know, the answer is the smaller government is, the better off we really all are. I'd say that the reason why I got involved in politics was uh, because I had always wanted to get involved in business. And I looking uh just you know, as a middle schooler and, and high schooler uh for seeing myself running any business I, I looked at the policies and i realized that there's no way in hell i'll be able to run a successful business with the amount of policies that are in place today and it's so far you know i'm going to see that effect no matter what so let's let's talk a little bit more or remind folks about your upcoming event at the dante club the intersection of business and politics well it's on october the 17th the uh, registration starts at five o'clock uh, you can register by going to www.limittaxes.eventbrite.com, and that's eventbrite, B-R-I-T-E, dot com. And you can register anytime. The event starts You can register anytime. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Well, welcome to the... I'll be there. I, I've already bought my ticket. Great. So I'm I'll looking forward to it. And you can watch uh, Libertarian Counterpoint uh, every Thursday at 8, every Friday at noon, every Saturday morning. At 4 a.m., if you're so inclined, also on the web at www.accesssacramento on YouTube and on Facebook. Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you again next week.